him in so high and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our turtle. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. Number five now. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one. No, not one, will he refuse as a home in heaven? No, not one, no, not me. Jesus knows all about our trouble. He will guide till the day is. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. And Father, we are grateful that you are our friend, and we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship and to serve you today. Pray that you bless our time together tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Now take, take a moment, shake two or three hands. Y'all are so scattered out. Come further down this way, and we'll <laughs> at least shake three people's hands you hadn't talked to tonight. <laughs> And you can you can find a seat now. And turn to number four hundred thirty nine. Number four thirty nine after you're seated. Number four thirty nine. I come, Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee out of my sickness into thy hand, out of my want and into thy wealth out of my sin and into thyself jesus i come to thee verse number three out of unrest and arrogant pride jesus i come Jesus, I come into thy blessed will to abide. Jesus, I come to thee out of myself to dwell in thy love, out of despair in raptures above upward for hey, on wings like a dove jesus i come to thee out of the fear and dread of the tomb jesus i come Jesus, I come into the joy and light of my own. Jesus, I come to thee 
Out of the depths of ruin untold Into the place of thy self-earning mold Ever thy glorious face to behold Jesus, I come to thee. All right. We're going to sing one more. It's, it's a hymn we often use for an invitation. Uh, before we sing, though, let me remind you that this Wednesday night, children work on Easter and adults work on Easter, plus the Bible study and the meals and all the other stuff that goes on. So at 6.30 Wednesday night, if you'd like to join the choir, That'd be fun and fa fantastic if you want to come. We'll put you to work, and the children will be doing the same thing in their uh, area. Hymn number 465, Only Trust Him, often an invitation hymn. Pay attention to these words. They're really good. Come, every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. For Jesus shed His precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Come then and join this holy band and on to glory go. To dwell in that celestial land where joys immortal flow. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Good singing. All right, Pastor. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. All right, we are going to have a message here on hell. Why would a loving God send someone to hell? Now, on Sunday nights, I put the Sunday night info in the bulletin. I'm, I really want you to have it because I'm actually going to use it more than normal. So you have a few minutes because I'm going to make a couple of announcements to give you the opportunity to go back to the back and grab you a bulletin. So you want to make sure you grab a bulletin. Online, folks, if you're, if you're watching live, you need to log on to our church's website. Click on the bulletin tab, and you can read the bulletin and follow along right there now. Now, when folks are, are just coming in while they're grabbing their bulletin, I'll announce a couple of things, a couple of administrative things. Two weeks from tonight is going to be a special Sunday night. We are going to have an African worship service now, anyone is welcome to come. It's one time. We're going to try this out. It's going to be led by Raphael and Innocent, and they are from the continent of Africa. When we say African, we're talking about, as you know, people from the continent of Africa. It's, uh, that is where Christianity is growing in sub-Saharan Africa, very much so. And we have a, a lot of folks in our church here with an African connection. So, um, in fact, our sound man, Phil, back there, he's uh, from, uh, he was, I believe, born in Nigeria, served as an IMB missionary there for many years in Nigeria. So just even here tonight, we have African. I think Phil even has a, a dual citizenship, too. So he's actually an African citizen with that. So we have a lot of different connections. I'll tell you another African connection. I received an email this week from someone named Tracy Miller. Do you all remember Tracy Miller? 
she moved to South Carolina, Georgetown, South Carolina. She sat about right there. About three years ago, she, she joined her church, and then um, the Lord led her down to South Carolina. And she, next month, is leaving for a five-week mission trip to um, um, Uganda. She's going to be going to Uganda for five weeks, and she will be back here the first week in May. And she said she's going to come visit. It's going to give her an opportunity to share about her mission trip there to Africa, um, just briefly, just give us a brief update. Some of you might remember her. Uh, that is Tracy Miller with that. Uh, for add to your prayer list, um, I got a phone call on Friday. Many of us know he's our former moderator, Dr. McLemore. Um, um, gosh, um, what was his first name? Jim? James and Lorreen McLemore. They were diagnosed Friday with covid so, you know, they live in the care facility right here across the street. So we want to be praying for them. They're both uh, on up there. So we want to definitely lift them up. And they're in uh, quarantine isolation for about two weeks. So that's where Dr. McElmore. And you're welcome to give them a call. Send them a note. I know they would. It would be a, a, a blessing for them to, to hear about that. So those are some of the things here going on in our church. Uh, exciting times, especially learning about missions and about Africa uh, uh, in two weeks especially. Um, oh, two week service from tonight. Tonight's message is one that I believe we, I have heard it said many times that a preacher cannot preach on hell without a tear in his eye. Because what I'm going to speak on tonight, folks, is not a joke. It's, it's a reality. And the truth is, most people on earth today are lost. They're lost. There are people right now and I commend you for coming to church on Super Bowl night. I want to tell you, about 12 years ago, I was in Georgia. And I had several folks come up to me and say, Pastor, you need to cancel the Sunday night service. The Super Bowl used to start earlier. Notice it's getting later and later every time. So 6.30 actually means it won't get started until 6.45 or so. It's just it keeps getting pushed back later, six, 7 o'clock even. And that's a four-hour game, so it goes on forever. Well, it used to start earlier, so it would be like during church is you would you have church going on. In fact, when I was growing up, they would have these, it'd be like 5 o'clock it would start, and they'd have these worship services that tie in with the Super Bowl, and they would preach during halftime and show the game. And the problem is by the time it was third quarter, because the game went on, and on, I mean, everyone had left. I mean, they were at home in bed. By the, it just kept on going. But... Um, there are many people tonight, unfortunately, they are going to be living the high life, partying, and just uh, having Super Bowl. A lot of folks don't even like the Bengals and the Rams in this country. They don't, they don't even know anything about these teams. They're do, this is a party night. That's what this really is. That's what the Super Bowl, unfortunately, has become. And it's all here in our city and certainly across uh, the nation as well. And many of these folks that are living this way, just a party life, a lifestyle of just lostness apart from the Lord, the truth is the Bible speaks to them and says they're lost. If you're saved, your name is written in the book of life. That means you are going to heaven. If you are not saved, and remember what that means to be saved, that means the blood of Jesus has redeemed you from and saved you and forgiven you of your sin. And when you have been redeemed, you're going to heaven. If you have not received the forgiveness of sins from Jesus, the Bible describes the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's described as a fire that never goes out. The book of Revelation describes it as a fire, a lake of fire and burning sulfur. These aren't popular, common, friendly, user-friendly words to describe a place that we call hell. And the truth is, many people will attack the character of God and say, how could a loving God, and God is loving. We're going to look at some scripture here that points that He's loving. Over throughout the Old and New Testament shows the love of God. How could a God who loves humanity, who created humans, who sent His Son to die for us, 
sinned. And that's who. The devil doesn't send people to hell. It's the Lord that sends people to hell. The devil knows where he's going. Hell was actually created. I'm going to show you who hell was actually created for. It was created for fallen angels, which the devil is actually the chief of all, the prince of all the fallen angels. That's what hell was originally created for. We who reject Jesus as our Lord and Savior will actually go to a place that was created for fallen angels. It's a place of conscience. When you're in hell, you're very aware of it. We know that from Luke chapter 16 with the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was in hell. He was aware, conscious. He says his, it was so hot, there was no relief. He even cried out. He was aware of his suffering. And when we come across, or we have family members, that maybe tonight they're going to be partying, and they're just living this selfish, sinful lifestyle. We need to be praying to the Lord. Remember last Sunday what we preached on? I preached on about asking God to give you someone this week that you can share the good news about. You can tell them the good news. The good news is that Christ redeems us from hell. I believe a night like tonight, unfortunately, is a devil's night. It's like Halloween. It's like New Year's Eve. It's just a party night where there will be tragedy all across this nation. There will be unplanned pregnancies. There will be debauchery. There will be DUIs. There will be death. There will be just uh, 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 um, events that just uh, destroy lives. Drug use. Folks, do you know right up I-75 in Cincinnati, and many of the school districts, they've canceled school tomorrow. Because this is not, I'm not joking. They're expecting people to stay up so late. I guess party too. The kids aren't going to go to school in the morning. They're going to make it a holiday. Because the Super Bowl, the Bengals are playing it. Now this is in the city of Cincinnati, so they're excited about it. Their team hasn't been there in 34 years, so they're making a holiday. All right. I want you to look here. Pull out your bulletin and insert. Why would a loving God send someone to hell? Wayne Grudem, who is a theologian, who gives a definition of hell, he says hell is a place of eternal conscious punishment for the wicked. The key word there is eternal. The second key word there is conscious. The third key word is punishment. All of those words are true. You're aware of it. It's forever. And not only that, it's punishment. It's punishment for what? Why am I being punished? And that's what we're going to answer. We're about to look here. Now, in the Old Testament, the word that is used for hell is called Sheol. That means the unseen place. And I'm in my bulletin insert right here. I'm going down this. I'm actually going to read it to y'all because I want to explain this because we need to understand what we're talking about from the Old and New Testament about hell before we look at some scripture. It also means that phrase unseen world that also can be translated the place of the dead. So when you see the word hell used in the Old Testament, that's a reference to Sheol. It's a, a, a place for dead people. So it's an unseen world. It's, but it is a reference to to a conscious place that people who are dead where they live. We get to the New Testament here, and it becomes, the doctrine of hell becomes more developed. The doctrine of hell is pulled from three different words. And the first one is what we call Hades. Hades means it's a reference to a place of departed, wicked spirits. It's people who lived a wicked life, and the Bible says they go to Hades. It would be opposite of Sheol. Or it would be the same as Sheol, but it's the Greek. it would be the Greek versus the Hebrew word for that. But then Jesus commonly used this phrase here. He used the word Gehenna. Gehenna is, is actually a place. It's a trash dump. It's called the Valley of Gehenna. It's right outside of Jerusalem. And it is a trash dump. We don't burn our trash not good for the ozone to burn your trash 
But back 2,000 years ago, they didn't know that. Or if they did know it, they just went ahead and did it anyway. They would take their garbage in Jerusalem and dump it over a cliff and just burn. You're just constantly burning anything you want. So that place, Jesus described as the worm that never dies. He described it as that. That's Gehenna. Because it's just, it's just filth. I mean, it's just garbage. It's just constantly burning there. And that's where the whole city would dump all of their scraps. You would see half-dead dogs eating. You would see just, it's just nasty place. You never saw it in pictures. It's on the back side of the city. And it was just away from everything else. That is their trash dump. That is mainly what Jesus described hell. And I think the reason he picked that is because he wanted words to use instead of just describing it as a place of the dead. It's not that. This is the place where the fire never quenches. So when you say you're going to the valley of Gehenna, you know, oh, that's the trash dump. It's constantly burning. It never dies. No one would go there. There's no, no reason for anyone to want to go spend time at the trash dump that's always on fire. Number three, now this is actually the place, and we're going to start here, this passage here. You go ahead and turn your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 2. This is actually the word, Tartaru, this is actually why hell was created. And this word is used in the scripture as the place of eternal damnation for fallen angels. If you remember, in the book of now, we won't turn there. I'll, I'm going to reference it. Isaiah chapter 14, the scripture's right here. We get a picture of why angels rebelled against God. And it's actually revealed in the book of Isaiah. It's Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. And there is an angel called Lucifer, and he rebelled. This is actually before, before the earth possibly was created. So we don't exactly know this was before maybe day one. This occurred, this is one of these questions that you have to ask God. We don't exactly know when this occurred, but we do know by the time Adam and Eve were created and placed in the Garden of Eden, it had already happened. So when it happened, obviously, that's a question for the Lord. But it says here, in the reference in Isaiah, is Lucifer was filled with pride, he wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be like God. And he rebelled against the Lord. And the Lord and Jesus referenced this as well. This is why I think this is important. In, G in Luke chapter 19, Jesus says, He saw Satan fall like lightning. He was cast down from heaven. He was in the presence of God before the seven-day creation to apparently... I guess, earth or somewhere else. Maybe Tarta too. But we know the devil has access here on earth. Now, we know from the book of Job, we see a picture in Job chapter 1 that Lucifer, Satan, which means the adversary, was able to still go into the presence of God. So, the devil possibly could actually go among all three of these different places. Tarta to earth, and heaven. Again, these are questions we're not going to know until we get to heaven. We have glimpses of it from Job chapter 1, from Isaiah chapter 14. But we can sort of take pieces here and there and try to uh, determine wh wh the origin of Satan. I purposely believe that God did not want us to totally know everything in the world about the devil because it's unimportant. That's not the priority for us. The, the priority is that we need to be aware there is an adversary, there is a devil. His home is actually Tartatu. It's a place for fallen angels. And that will actually become the place where people who reject Jesus go to. Most people who die will go to Tartatu, this place that was created actually for the devil and angels based on what happened in Isaiah chapter 14. So these, these are the places that we see here. But let's go ahead and look at this. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and delivered them 
in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment. That, that means these angels were not spared. They are awaiting. Now, apparently, they're not all awaiting because some are still out there. This is a fallen angel is what we call a demon. But many are still chained up and they're awaiting this judgment. God cast them into hell. They sinned against the Lord. It is possible even for an angel to sin against God. All right, so the, then we get to the question, where did hell come from? Where, is the, where did this place arise? Where do we first see the mention of hell? And that answer is in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I'm going to read this scripture for you. Genesis three fifteen. This here is the punishment for Adam and Eve's disobedience. And if you remember what happened, God looked at Adam. He blamed Eve. Eve says, hey, the serpent made me do it. And, this, and God looks at the serpent who was talking and walking, who deceived Eve. That's what the devil does. It's a deception. That's why tonight is so dangerous. It's a night of deception. We need to be aware of all the deception around us. There's many things that we are told throughout our day that we go about and we just think, oh, that's how things are. Let's just think about deception. Deception would be like, oh, people don't go to church anymore. Oh, people aren't going to come. God's not going to answer that prayer. I was talking to somebody tonight. They're seeing answers of prayer. And there's this belief that, oh, it's, it's just, it doesn't apply anymore to us. That's old-fashioned. Folks, the Bible we preach out of is over 2,000 years old. Well, usually when people talk old-fashioned, they're just talking 50, 60 years ago, old-fashioned. This is a 2,000-year-old book. And the Bible says God is alive. This same book, the same words that were saving people when the King James Bible was published in 1611 are the exact same words of today, 400 plus years later. Nothing's changed. If anything's changed, the Bible has become more accurate because of archaeology. The Bible is even more true. But what we see here is there is something is going to happen here. And here's how the deception occurs. Verse 15, Genesis 3.15 says, I will put hostility between you and the woman. What is this hostility? The hostility here is sin. There's this, there's this problem. There's this, there's this it's, we're not just talking about a snake. We're talking about something deeper than this. There is this constant fight. Adam and Eve did not experience this hostility. This is so important. Hostility is the ongoing battle with sin. You wake up tomorrow. It's Valentine's Day. You are going to have a battle. A constant battle for your soul. And the hostility is basically this drawing away from you whom God created you to live for Him. And the devil, the serpent in the garden, because of the curse, it's pulling. It's pulling people away from the Lord. I will put a hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Who are these offspring here? I think this is actually a reference not just to regular people. This is a reference ultimately to Christ. From the woman comes Jesus. This is to Eve. You trace back Jesus' genealogy. It's traced all the way to Eve. At this point, Adam and Eve they didn't have any children. There are no offspring at this point. They don't have Cain and Abel. So we have, all of a sudden, there's this, hus there's this, this two offspring. Who is the offspring of the serpent? It's, it's the worldly people who are spiritually lost. Until you were saved, 
you were offspring. Don't miss this tonight. Listen to online, folks. Until you were saved, you were your offspring. Her offspring is Jesus. Look at these words. Your offspring is the devil. That's people. Because we were born into sin. Jesus, so important here. Her offspring is a reference to Jesus. He was not born into sin. His father was God. His mother was Mary, who came from ultimately, as we know, Eve. All of us are actually children of the devil. Until you are saved, you are owned by the devil. The moment Adam and Eve disobeyed God in that Garden of Eden, at that moment, sin has entered into, this is what we call original sin, every single child born of Adam and Eve is actually a child of the devil, on down, except for Jesus. And what happens here? He will strike your head. Meaning, Jesus... That first offspring there, her offspring, and some of your Bibles use the word crush, meaning devil, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Strike his heel means you'll bite him. He'll die, but he will destroy you. That is the very first mention of hell. Say, Pastor, where is it at? Striking your head kills the devil. There is a hostility here between them. We see this struggle between children of the devil and Jesus. Jesus came to redeem these children of the serpent. These children of the devil. People who were born into sin. The moment this occurred of disobedience. Say, Pastor, why did this happen? Why is God allowing this? And I'm going to show you this. God is a loving, perfect, holy God. Folks, I don't think we grasp what holiness means. Holiness is perfection. Perfection. There's nothing wrong in God. There is nothing wrong in heaven. Everything in heaven is absolutely perfect. There's nothing caught off guard. There's no mistakes. Nothing just happens. And someone who is sinful, someone who has disobeyed God, cannot go to heaven. Because that actually conflicts with the doctrine of God, of perfection, of holiness, of purity. A lost soul cannot save himself or herself. Nothing we can do. That's why we rely upon Mary's offspring. The person who comes from Eve to Mary, who is Jesus, crushed this serpent. This is a curse that is first coming right here in the garden. This was spoken in the Garden of Eden. Moving along here in your, in your little handout about this. That's where hell came from. It came from the curse of the serpent. It was created for this snake, which, is, which took the form of a serpent, which was the devil, which was the Bible calls the adversary, a fallen angel, a place called Tartatu. So, then we say, okay, who was hell created for? Hell's created for the devil and his angels. God's justice demands a hell. That's so important, understanding the justice of God. We don't understand justice today. Justice today, we think of attorneys. We think of just you know, leniency, trying to get a favorable... That's not how God's justice works. God's judgment, judgment is very black and white. It's right or wrong. In fact, go ahead and turn your Bible now to Matthew chapter 25. Why don't you look up this Bible verse? Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Jesus tells us about this story about the sheep and the goats. We won't read the entire 
this story about the sheep and the goats, but he says basically there's going to come this separation. There's going to be these sheep and there's going to be these goats. And the sheep represent believers and the goats represent the unbelievers. And the goats, these are people who do not serve, do not love, do not accept Jesus as their Savior. The sheep are us. If you're saved, you are a sheep and you follow Jesus' leadership. So look what Jesus says here in verse 41. And he says to those on the left, and the, the, those on the left are the goats. So all, over here on the left, you know, speaking of, of right and left, you know, I was so proud after the, this morning's 1115 service. I, this was a first in my life, David. I don't get a lot of firsts anymore, but I got one today. I had this gentleman come up to me in the Welcome Center. I, I, I stay back there and I shake hands and talk to folks and pray with folks. And someone came up to me and said, Sir, I loved your service, but there's one mistake. He served in the military. He loved our, our country. And he says, your flags are backwards. Apparently, he goes and speaks at different uh, events for veterans, and he understands the proper display of a flag. I don't know if you noticed this morning, the American flag was on this side, and the Christian flag was on that side. He told me, the proper display of the American flag. And everywhere he goes, he, in a kind way, corrects all sorts of different places. Schools, funeral homes, assemblies. Everywhere he goes, he, he fixes the problem. Churches. And he says, if you look up how to display a flag, when you, the way a podium works is what they call, you're looking out here, and it's on your left. But when you're looking from this, this is called stage right. When you're up on the podium and you're looking out to your right. So if, when the speaker to his right should always be the American flag. So they got swapped right there. So if Jesus was here speaking, he looks to his stage left over here towards the Christian flag, and he sees these goats. So I guess if you were a sanctuary, so this side would be the goats, this would be the sheep over here. Jesus looks over here at the goats, and this is what he says. Then he will say to all those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed. Cursed? Where did this curse come from? The curse came from Genesis 3.15. That's the curse. That's where sin came from. God is giving the curse of sin. You goats, you're over here. You have been cursed. And where are you going to go, Mr. Goats? You're going to go into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Those are demons. People who are on the left, the goats, are going to hell because they rejected Jesus' message. They are going to a place that wasn't even created for people. It was created for fallen angels and the devil. This is what, I tell you this, what's so powerful about this. What is it like to be a lost man in 2022? I don't even think lost people even know they're lost. They have been so deceived, and that's what the devil does. If you talk to a lost person, they have no idea they are even lost. They think things are great. Tonight's the Super Bowl. Let's go party. Have a good time. They are living for themselves. Our job, we are literally sounding the alarm, saying, repent. This is what John the Baptist did. Time is running out. Jesus is coming back. You're going to die and stand before the Lord. You know, the greatest miracle, do you know the greatest miracle we can experience today? It's not a miracle of healing. Now, a miracle of healing is actually great. We want to see healings. We want to see folks restored. We want to see prayers are answered. But the greatest miracle we can experience today is actually the discovery of truth and the discernment of truth. You say, what do you mean, the discovery of truth? When a lost person gets a hold of their Bible, when you go read the Scriptures, you give a Bible, a Gideon's give the Bible, and they all of a sudden start reading the Scriptures, and it starts speaking to them, God's truth speaks to them. The greatest discovery that anyone can make is to actually discover the Word of God, which is truth. Because everything else out there, and there's a lot of stuff out there, it's lies. 
It's deception. The serpent deceived Eve. There was deception involved. Not only that, we live in this generation. There is a smoke of hell all around folks. In fact, if you go up to someone and you start talking about hell, they think it's a joke. They literally think this is a joke. Do you remember? I want to give you a perfect illustration of the biggest joke in the Bible. Do you remember Lot? The story of Lot found in Genesis 18 and 19. The angels came in to rescue Lot, who's Abraham's nephew. It's a wicked, immoral city of Sodom. And the angels go in there and say, Lot, you've got a wife and three girls. And all your girls are engaged. But it's time to leave the city because the Lord is going to destroy this place very soon. So why don't we pack up our bags and it's time to get out of town. Let's hit the road ASAP. That's what the angel said. And it said that Lot hesitated going. He went and approached his future sons-in-laws. And this is perfect example of today, 2022. And he goes up. This is who his girls are going to marry. Say, sons-in-laws. It says they were eating and drinking. Literally, it's like a Super Bowl night. If you go back and read that. You should read it tonight during the Super Bowl. They're eating, drinking, having a good time watching the game, and he goes up to them and says, boys, we got to get out of town. The Lord is going to destroy this place. He's going to rain down sulfur. And it says they laughed at him. They thought he was joking. Everything is a joke. A big joke. Who cares? Have a beer. Relax. Lot, Lot, chill out. What are you doing? Folks, that is the response of people today. You talk, to, you talk to a lost person, they think you're joking with them. Do you know, the moment they, as far as they could get out, they didn't make it very far, God immediately destroyed that city of Sodom. Those three men died. They were killed by raining sulfur of the Lord. God did not hesitate destroying that city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah. And I don't believe today, we we absolutely, we are the most blessed nation on earth, but within a heartbeat, God would destroy America. There is no reason for him not to. If he can, if he will let his chosen Israelites go into slavery, if he will allow David's kingdom, who passed it off to Solomon, and Solomon became wicked, and then the kingdom split, and then was destroyed by the Babylonians. It didn't take long. If he'll do it to his own people, whom he chose, whom his son came through, who's Jewish, He will absolutely do it to us. Folks, we're absolutely living the last days. This is a reality. There's goats on Jesus' left that they are just awaiting wickedness. There's a punishment coming. Literally, the smoke is rising around us. They're already burning. Lostness is apparent all around us. Everywhere we go, there's lost people. I mean, I'm even convinced you come to church, people whom we assume are saved, people who we think have the Holy Spirit inside them, people whom we just think, well, they came. Well, they came to Sunday school. If they haven't been born again, if they haven't had a conversion experience, if they haven't repented of their sin and turned to Jesus, they're lost. They're on the left. They do not know the Lord. Many Christians cringe and are embarrassed embarrassed to speak about hell i'm in a thursday men's discipleship group and we were talking about i want you you know i've lived in lexington a little over five years now do y'all know what's the most shocking thing i have found in this city y'all know i'm a southern bible believing baptist i believe in the inerrancy of the scripture as scriptures i was raised in alabama i grew up preaching in rural country Alabama churches I went to a Baptist college went to New Orleans seminary all about New Orleans Baptist theological seminary I, I served in a country Georgia church and here in Lexington the churches in this city are liberal and they say what do you mean pastor liberal they don't preach on hell they don't listen 
There's lots of social needs in our city. Homeless people everywhere. There's opportunity to serve our city here in Lexington. But the greatest message you and I have as Christians is not giving a cup of cold water. It's giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. There's a difference. Jesus says, you do. If you're going to go give a cup of cold water, you make sure you attach the gospel to it. Because if you have not attached the gospel, you are just doing social work. Let the government give a cup of cold water. I want to give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. It's the name of Jesus that saves our city. Folks, do you even know, could you name 20 Bible-believing churches in this city that actually teach and preach the Bible? I don't want you to actually do it. We don't ever want to call out churches. We never want to do that. But the truth is, we are surrounded by this type of Christianity that's a, what we call a social gospel. We have hundreds of thousands of lost people in Fayette County, Kentucky. This city has so much influence over central Kentucky. There is so much opportunity for soul winning and seeing lost people turn from their sin and turn from the Lord. But I want to tell you why they don't do it. Folks, I'm going to tell you why. It's not going to happen. There's addictions all in. Think about all the distilleries. Think about UK sports. Think about all the bars and the party place in the city. There's so many distractions that the devil has planted all around this city. Folks don't even think about church. They don't even think about the Lord. Now, I believe actually they do think about the Lord. They lay in their bed at night and they realize there's got to be more. But then the moment they get up, they've got an activity, 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 activity to do. And they don't have an encounter with a Christian who challenges them. Says, son, are you saved? Do you know the Lord? Have you been born again? Because hell is real. Folks, we can't be embarrassed. This is, I, I'd say this with, sh with a tear in my eye. There is a reality these people are going to a place that were created for fallen angels. That's what this is created. Tartitu is not a good place. It's a place for the demonic. You know what Baptists need? Baptists need a baptism of the hatred of the devil. The devil has deceived and blinded so many people around us. And we need to go back to saying, this devil wants to destroy your marriage, to destroy your life, your teenagers, your grandkids, and if you don't see it, you're blind. He has blinded you. And it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And what happened? He's hell. You have to literally say, I'm not going to allow anyone in my house, any one of my friends, go to this place. You have to make sure you're praying your people out of hell. When I say out of hell, they're born into sin. By, by default, your default status, you were born into sin, if you don't repent, you just go to hell. Only people who repent and get saved go to heaven. So by default, you're just naturally into sin. You never have to teach young people how to sin. They'll just do it on their own. Never. They just will start lying themselves. You never once have to teach people how to do wrong. You teach them what to do right. That's what God's holiness. Look at here. Hell is real. It's a real place. This is not pretend land. This is a place of reality. And you say, Daniel, I don't like that word. Well, then call it Gehenna. That's what Jesus called it. Then call it Tartitu. Call it Hades. Call it Sheol. It's all the same place in the Bible. It's a place of wickedness and everlasting judgment. Hell is a real place. Not only that, we have to remember, we as Christians, we are part of the church. We, the church is victorious. Jesus says, Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not prevail over it. He said that. He declared it right there in, in, with Peter and says, I'm giving you the keys, meaning you're going to start a church, a movement, a body that will push back against this lostness. That is our life and all we do. I'm constantly, I hope you're constantly praying for me. I hope I'm praying for you. You're praying for opportunities to, to push back. And we experience victory. Folks, the reason we, we don't experience more victory is because we're 
there's minutia in church life. I want to tell you, hey, let me, here's the problem with churches. Committees, positions, uh, events, things to do, socials. These are all good things, and they, yes, they serve a purpose, but that is not the victory Jesus has taught. That's not the power of the gospel. Sitting around, Jesus didn't come to die for you to sit in a meeting. Can you imagine, David, someone gets saved? They get saved and say, welcome to Broadway. We're going to put you on a committee. And you get to go attend a two-hour meeting and play in a dinner. And to serve the fellow believers. Huh? That's not New Testament Christianity. That's not the book of Acts. Folks aren't getting saved by doing that. These folks were crying out, begging for the Holy Ghost to come and move. And say, I'll give us a lost soul. Show me someone who needs to get saved. Help me have a redemptive spirit of this immoral city we live in that's so desperate for the gospel. That's who, what we need. The church, we have victory. But we forgot where the victory is at. It's not in meetings. It's not in events. It's, it's in this dependency upon the Lord. Revival is now. It's not tomorrow. It's now. You can experience a change today. Ask God this week again to give you a lost soul. Say, Lord, put someone in my life to share the good news with. Do not waste any conversation you have with someone. If you know someone doesn't know the Lord, you need to make sure you work in that message of the good news. And I want to tell you this, worship is pleasing to God. Did you all know that? Worship pleases the Lord. God wants His people. Not only is this a place of worship, we come into this place and we give praise to Him. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for saving lost people. Every time we give an invitation at this church, I want you to be sitting in your pew, praying or standing in your pew, praying for a lost soul. We assume people are saved, but we don't know. Statistics show that people are lost, because most folks are lost. And there were lost people here this morning, our morning services. I know, we had visitors here. They just didn't know the Lord. And amen, this is the place where it be, but this is the salvation center where you come and meet Jesus. And that pleases the Lord. Look here in your Bibles here. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to wrap this up. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. Jesus here tells us about hell. He warns us about the dangers of what happened if we don't uh, if we don't repent, this is why people are going to hell. He says here, Matthew 5, 29, if your right eye, here's my right eye, if it causes you to sin, that's a reference to lust. Jesus says if you lust, that you're actually committing adultery. If you are looking at things that you should not look at. So let's just think about that. Could there be some things that we should not be looking at? Pornography? Maybe there's some movies you shouldn't be watching. Maybe there's some stuff on, on social media that you shouldn't be watching on Instagram. Maybe some TikTok videos. There's stuff out there that you should not be watching. Your right eye, whom the, the Lord created that eye, you are witnessing things that a believer should not be doing. You're looking at things, you're lusting after things, it causes you to, the, your, through your eyes, it's getting to your heart, which is leading you astray. The man who commits adultery doesn't just start out, walk, walk into a bedroom, and oh look, there she is. No, he was already looking. It starts with a look. He was already looking at her message on Facebook, looking at the message on his phone, a text. It starts with looks, and then it moves on. And look what he says here. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. That word hell there is a reference to Gehenna. That's the word that's used. You're going to the Gehenna, the trash dump. If your right hand causes you to sin, so your right hand now, think about things you do. You, you can hit someone, you can shoot them with a gun, you can punch them in the face, whatever you do with your right hand. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away, 
For it is better for you to use one part of the, your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Jesus is telling us hell is such a bad place. It is a place such of wickedness and torment that it would actually be better for you to gouge your right eye and cut off your right hand. You don't realize this, but you're actually doing it yourself a benefit by cutting off your body parts than going into this place. That is how dangerous and awful this place is when he's talking about Gehenna. People who refuse to repent of their sins. That's what he's talking about. Unconfessed sin leads people to hell. The last thing I want to share, I won't put, we won't turn there, but in John 3, 8, this is how we know God is working. And God is working tonight. There's this force that wants to kill the wind. I said, Pastor, what are you talking about? A force that wants to kill the wind. John 3, 8, Jesus says in his, in his, when he spoke to Nicodemus, he had a nighttime conversation with Nicodemus, and he starts talking about the wind. So I guess it was windy in Jerusalem at that time. And he says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. And it was windy a couple of days this past week. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. That's an obvious statement. It's windy. You hear the sound of wind. You see the effects of wind, but we ultimately don't know which direction the wind's going to blow. And we th- we, it's blowing this way, but at any moment it could change a different way. It's the wind. You don't see the wind. But so look at this. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. That means there's the wind of the Holy Ghost out there blowing, meaning God is working. We don't know where God is working. Although we do some know where God is working. I believe God is absolutely working in our church. He's working in many of your lives. But you go about your day, and the Lord's speaking to people and prepping people for conversations and encounters that you're going to have with folks. We do not know where the wind has been blowing in their life. And we need to be aware that the Holy Spirit could be working and blowing in someone's life, preparing them to get saved. And I believe, going back to the devil wanting to kill the wind, the devil does not want the wind of the Holy Ghost blowing. Because the wind of the Holy Ghost means someone's going to get saved. Prayers are going to get answered. The people, marriages are going to get restored. People will get healed. Relationships will get mended. Children will turn away from their wickedness and turn to Jesus. That's how the wind works. Jesus tells us the Holy Spirit is working here in Lexington. It's with the wind is blowing all around us. And we always need to be aware of that. We don't know who's ready to be saved. We don't know what God has in store for this day. Folks, this time next week, it is actually very likely, if we could fast forward one, one week, it'll be what, the 20th, I'll be standing here on Sunday night church, and there'll be a war going on right now in Ukraine. Very likely it happened this week, because the Olympics are about to end. And then it's time for Russia to invade Ukraine. And we will be standing right here, and on your mind, you will be thinking about war. I can even preach on what is a just war. When is it right to go to war? I share this because we we don't know our future. There will be people in Ukraine right now, possibly thousands of them. This Sunday, they are alive. Next Sunday, they're with Jesus. This could be their last week. Folks, there could be people, even here tonight, this is your last week of life. Folks online, this could be the last sermon you ever hear. And I think the message for us tonight is God's Spirit is working. We need to be aware that the devil, there is an evil oppression out there that wants to kill the Spirit's movement in our lives. That wants to completely deceive people in Broadway Baptist Church. That wants to fool us thinking things that are not important whatsoever are important. Our priority is pushing back 
against the forces and the power of the devil. The devil, the Bible tells us, in Revelation chapter 21, is going to this place of of burning sulfur. It's an everlasting fire called the lake of fire. It never ceases. He, along with the false prophet, along with the Antichrist, will be chained up forever. That is their home. But there's no reason for another human to be joining them down there. That is why there's such an urgency to share the gospel and to see people turn away from their sin. This week, I want to ask you again. Ask the Lord. Lord, will you give me an opportunity to share the good news? Because there's people all around me who are spiritually dead. And they are going to this place called Tartu, created for fallen angels, also known the devil. I'm going to pray for you. God, I pray for the folks here tonight. I thank you for them coming out here on a Super Bowl night when they could be watching garbage on TV. But they've come to study what the Bible teaches about hell, which is a real place for people who do not know you. Lord, I pray that you will give us opportunity. Lord, give us a soul. Give us a soul tonight. Someone needs to get saved here. Lord, someone online is watching this. Who's going to watch it later on? And they need to turn from their sins and turn to you. Lord, put someone in our life whom we can tell the good news to. Help us see our short lifespan. All that matters is where someone spends eternity. Lord, the families who are here that are raising children and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren in such an ungodly place. Lord, help the homes be Christian homes. Lord, help the wind blow in our homes so we can see the work of the Spirit. Help it blow in our church, in our lives. Lord, we want to see people saved. Give us a lost soul. Lord, redeem those who are deceived. Jesus, I pray this invitation will not pass without us responding to you. You call us boldly to cut off our hand, to poke out our eyes, meaning we need to do whatever it takes to get down this altar and come to you, Jesus. There's no hesitation. Lord, I pray this invitation is our time that we respond to your calling. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to close out with an invitation. I'm going to invite everyone to stand. David Dell's going to lead us in our song. Let's stand together. If you want to get saved tonight, I'll be waiting down front for you to respond. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. David, thank you so much for that. I want to let y'all know, I I talked this morning about uh, Evan McPherson and about a wonderful story about this young man who is the kicker for the Bengals, so maybe he'll kick a field goal or two tonight uh, when the game kicks off. But um, I shared, if you're Facebook friends with me, I shared a little video. His church is uh, First Baptist Church of Fort Payne, Alabama. So I shared, they, they shot a little video. I thought it was really neat for their little hometown church encouraging him. Their whole little town there in Fort Payne, Alabama, decorated all the Bengals uh, stuff and put the Who Day. I don't even know what Who Day stands for, but whatever it means, that's their cheer. But that, uh, they're, they're uh, cheering him on. So that, uh, make sure you take a look at that and uh, certainly be a great testament. I tell you. And I want you to be praying for him tonight. If they win, the Bengals win, and he kicks the field goal, he'll give glory to the Lord. It really points people to Jesus. God will use these, these football games for actually the athletes to point people to Christ. So that's a very encouraging fact. I will see you all Wednesday night. We will be right here for a dinner at 530, and then not right here. We'll be downstairs at 630, 
in our Deuteronomy Bible study. So, all right, Dave. Sing this chorus with me. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust right, him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Amen. God bless you.